Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back to this new episode of Latin American football. I know it's been a while. I know we've been uh, far away from the media for a while already. I apologize for that. We've been creating new content. We will, <laughs> we've been taking vacations as well. But we're back and we're back with a very good friend of Bolivar News and of this Latin American football space we have. And it's a big, big honor for me to have one of the heads of um, the smoking snake. So, Enric Minyach, my friend, welcome to this. That is your space as well. Hey, man, how's it going? As always, very happy to be here. And it's an honor for me to represent not only Santos, but Brazilian football in general. So we're here to talk about it. Lovely, my friend. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm so glad to having you here again. And this, it, it's it's really been a while, and it's always great to talk to you. The knowledge you uh, you guys have about the the Brazilian football, especially Santos, it's great. So today we will be visiting that, of course. And the idea is to talk about um, Santos and Bolivar mainly, but. Also, we will discuss a little of uh, Libertadores, what is happening, what is coming today. We have March tomorrow as well. Uh, we are on the semifinals. Uh, also, the qualifiers for the national squads. We have a lot to talk about today. One of the main topics for the day, as we promised on the Twitter, is the stadiums. Because we have uh, such a coincidence now that both teams are building the new stadium so we will talk about that in a moment so Enric if you wish we can start with Santos so tell me what is going on on Villa Belmiro these days well things didn't start well uh, since last time we talked Santos has gone from an average team looking at the table to a uh, I would say very bad with recent performances, but in the last couple of match weeks, of course, we had new signings coming into the club. Everything's changed, and now we seem to be like a club back to our glory days, winning matches either at home or away. So uh, it's not looking perfectly right as people or fans would expect, but at least it's getting better compared to the situation before. What about you and Bolivar, Sepe? Well, Bolivar, we have a big pulse on, and I, I, I can go there. Um, we have a big uh, pulse for the tournament uh, due to this much fixing uh, accusations from the Federation. So we had kind of 35 days without football, no football at all for more than a month. And here's the thing, here's what happened, because many people also wrote me to to ask what happened there, why there's no league in Bolivia, why is there's no football, why there's so much noise. What is happening is that one day there was a recording, it was, it was actually a WhatsApp audio message that leaked uh, to the media and to the um, football management in Bolivia. And it was that dialogue between a referee and a club chairman telling that this referee will receive some money if they wish to a penalty kick, if they have some kind of result. So match fixing, in other words. Mm -hmm. So based on that, what the reaction from the, from the chairman of the Bolivian Football Federation was to directly accusate uh, these people and say that they will be opening investigations and the football will have to stop. Which at that moment sounds, how to say, reasonable. But one week after when they said that they will provide more details, they actually did not provide more details. They actually say, we will not provide more details because that will make 
uh, or, or was somehow sabotaging the investigations. So they decided to not to show those um, those proofs, let's say. And we have, well, they, um, they said that we will decide what to do while the investigations are on course. And for 34, 35 days, we have no football practice. Then it was uh, those um, those accusations went were sent to the attorney, and the attorney reject them, as they're not wow. enough. Uh, let's say um, they're not quite valid. I don't know what's the exactly term, the exact terminology. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, in and uh, sorry, in the meantime, they were um, somehow discussing if we should start a new tournament which yeah sounds reasonable if there were much much fixing in the previous one sounds reasonable to start a new one but the strongest was the on the lead uh, was leading the the ranking they said no no way i i i was leading the ranking there are no uh, sentence yet for from the from any an attorney from any uh, judge there is nothing um that gives the uh, this um, uh, the the punishment. We don't know anything yet, so you cannot stop the the league and start it over. And yeah, at the end of this, the end of the story, or to make uh, this long story short, we resumed the league yesterday. And I mean, there was a mess. One month lost um, without uh, any result. But Bolivar won 5 0 to always ready, which is good for me or for us, for the Bolivar itself. But yeah, we really waste time there. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah, the result explains for itself. I think Bolivar and Bolivian teams were eager, eager for that restart. And I think scoring five goals to a rival is pretty good, in my opinion. And you talked about the betting scandal and unfortunately something similar happened in Brazil as well in the last couple of months in which many players were involved and we saw exits uh, in the last month or two. Even from Santos, uh, one of our main defenders, Eduardo Bauerman, uh, he had to move to, I believe, Greece or Cyprus. Uh, I forget the team's name because he was just no longer allowed to play for Santos. He was involved in match fixing or a scandal last year in a game against uh, currently Serie B side Avai, in which uh, he was meant to get a yellow card or get sent off, something similar to that. And he did it and he pretty much came in like blamefully the guy who, who got the red card on purpose. So yeah, it's sad to see these things on football and hopefully uh, these actions are going to make players not receive money in the future and be part of these scandals anymore. But the league continue while this happening, right? Correctly. And I think the players uh, were the ones who were pulled aside from each team and they weren't allowed to play for a certain time until everything cleared up. And of course, there were some players that had nothing to do with the scandal. And okay, they were allowed to go back to the team. But players like Eduardo Barman, who came in and they actually found him guilty, they weren't allowed back at the club. Well, he could have played still, but Santos was the team that said, I'm sorry, we can't have these sort of actions be part of our club. The club is always higher than any player. And he was sent, uh, as I think he was sent on loan and he has an option of coming back once everything's cleared up. But still, I really doubt that he's going to come back because currently he's in Europe. And of course, any player in Brazil would love to have the opportunity to play there where it's where whether if, if it's Spain, England, or even a, a club in Turkey, in my opinion. Oh, I see. Yeah, but that, that was a way how to resolve this. What was made by the Bolivian Federation was really, really not responsible at all. Um, they just suspended the whole league. And mm-hmm. we waste a lot of time. And imagine that we have a, a World Cup qualifiers even so the, there's then the, the the players are not ready are not uh, on this 
competition uh, you know rhythm that they they are supposed to have so yeah it's it's crazy stuff that happens and <laughs> happens often on the on the bolivian league but yeah that's that's about it and Enric, i heard about new signings new co newcomers and in, in santos you're almost renewing a lot of people there so yeah uh it's been a good run so far of course we had good players last season or in the beginning of the season but the team looking at how things went i believe around match week 19 we were sitting either 15th in the table or lower than that if not in the relegation zone so things were not looking good and i think the president did a good job and bringing not old players because they're still 27 28 if not a little bit older but players who have uh experience like if i could say the veteran players because santos i think i said this in a different podcast they're looked in europe like the ajax of brazil because they always produce new stars whether it's neymar rubinho rodrigo who is doing amazingly well at real madrid and they just sell them for a huge amount of money and uh, in the recent year, since I believe 2019 or 2020, things haven't been looked good. Uh, overall, Santos has used averagely 24, 25 years old in the team. And I think that's not a good idea because they're not used to losses or being two goals behind. And when you have those older players that sort of give you a motivation and push you forward, uh, like the veterans, to in order to play i think it's always a good idea and looking at the players position by position i will start with the first one who is dodo uh currently uh he played in, in the beginning of his career with corinthians and bahia and then uh he moved into europe where he played for roma where he had around 30 appearances and then uh, I really remember him and his days back in Inter Milan. I used to support Inter Milan back in the days. Not anymore, but yeah, I really remember Dodo. And uh, at that time, he was playing as a right back. Now he came in at Santos, uh, despite being here at the club in 2018, played for Cruzeiro, Atletico Mineiro, and then again came back. And I think he's done amazingly well as a left back. And it's a position that we definitely needed. There are some other signings that the team brought in in terms of defending because, of course, uh, I know I'm mentioning many defenders' names, but it's an area that the team needed definitely to improve on. Uh, starting with Junior Kaisara, um, he had spells in Schalke, I believe, for Germany, and then also played for Istanbul Basak uh, or most recently since 2016-2017 season. So almost uh, six years now, so he has plenty of experiences also played for uh, Bulgarians uh, Ludogorets. So that's another signing that could be added on. Um, in terms of midfielders, uh, Jean Lucas, formerly a Santos player uh, and also a Flamengo player, uh, who also played for Lyon and Monaco, came back to the team. And this is also another good signing because it's an area that the team was lacking uh, players on and somebody would get injured and it would always be the 16 to 17 years old playing and doing stupid mistakes sorry for the language uh, every match week and think we're in looking good and yeah we needed definitely changes another name that many people probably remember is the Venezuel venezuelan uh rincon played for genoa juventus and torino since 2014 2015 season so a player that has played a lot in Syria, uh, also played for Sampdoria until last year and then moved into Santos. And I really like the signing in our most recent match that we played against Vasco da Gama, two teams that historically they've always been good, but this match was definitely a match for the relegation and whoever wins uh, won that one would mean that they would get out of that relegation zone. And uh, Rincon actually came in and he scored the goal in the 4-1 winning match against Vasco. So, uh, love to see players having the opportunity to start in the starting 11 and also score. So, uh, it's looking averagely very good for Santos. And we also have uh, some signings in the attack as well. Morelos uh, played for Rangers for a long time. He hasn't had a start yet, but usually if the team needs him, he can always come in as a sub. 
And of course, the Argentinian Julio Furch, uh, 34 years old, played for um, Arsenal, Belgrano, San Lorenzo, uh, and most recently at Santos Laguna and Atlas in Mexico. So uh, he hasn't had uh, starting matches for Santos yet either. But in terms of performances, uh, back like a month or two ago, we were losing 1-0 to Gremio. Uh, he came on, scored the winning goal in the 96th minute. And he did the same exact thing against Bahia a week and a half ago. Another 2-1 win, this time away from home. So, again, another opportunity for these players to prove themselves to the Brazilian team and maybe get the starting role in the coming weeks. Yeah. And how much you spend on that? I mean, I it's like eight players that you're signing now, right? How, how much you spend on that? Usually, uh, you would see players in Brazil moving either on a loan move or free move. So I think any of those players either came on a loan or for free and the club barely spent anything. And if they did spend, all of them together would be maybe, I would say, 800k to a million max, but nothing major as we usually see in Brazil. So again, love to see players coming in. And of course, when the club isn't spending either, that's even a better idea. Yeah, so I mean, uh, from uh, from from a business perspective, it, it sounds sounds great. I mean, I know there's a lot of movement financially talking on on Brazil. It's way different than the rest of the region. I mean, this it's crazy how we see. But I mean, it's it's like Brazil itself how it works because Brazil is like um, an island in Latin America. That they they have their own economy, they love to to just to, to, to consume their own products, football included. I mean, they are actually bringing back a lot of superstars. Not only Santos, it's Flamengo. It's been years that they are doing that. Of course, they the results are visible. They are winning uh, championships and stuff like that. So it's it's really, really crazy what is happening there. Um, yeah, and you mentioned Flamengo and actually them alongside Palmeiras. I would consider them in a different island compared to the Brazil island because, of course, they have the money and they have the power to do that because let's look at Flamengo. Since 2019, when they won the Libertadores, uh, Gabi Gol, for example, that played for Inter Milan, went to Benfica, came in a loan move to Santos. Flamengo was the one who bought him. And I think he's uh, the club's most expensive signing ever. I believe 16 or 17 million euros. And it just explains to you how these teams who are doing good in the continental competitions, one of the reasons of doing so is because they're bringing in players and important players. They brought in... Uh, Felipe Luis that played for Atletico Madrid, uh, Valencia's goalkeeper, I forget his name, he has retired now, but of course, there's many, many names that currently play at the club, like Everton Cebolinha, also another player that had a move uh, to Benfica, didn't go well, but again, came back to Flamengo and he's been playing amazingly. Pedro, he played for Fiorentina in Italy and look at him now, he's scoring goals left, right and center, of course maybe last season being better comparison to this one. But of course, Flamengo and Palmeiras are in a completely different level. And I hope that in a short period of time, maybe three or four years, you would be the opposite because I like the Brazilian teams when they're pretty much balanced and I don't want any team to spend more than another. Yeah, and also David Luiz, uh, that they have a William, I mean, right. Dani Alves, uh, many, mm -hmm. many of them. Or, or what were brought back okay and Rick, then of course for the bolivian people <laughs> it's our our god <laughs> the future of bolivian football miguelito miguelito we, we always wanted updates from miguelito and uh, you being that close to santos maybe you can give us appreciations maybe, maybe any latest update what, what do we have from, from Miguelito? Well, one thing is for sure. He is a talent that hopefully we can see him in the Santos shirt more often. But at the moment, 
it's not looking like he is starting or making those starting moves as you would normally see a player at his age in Brazil. Uh, looking at his most recent performances, I know he played for Bolivia in the uh, uh, World Cup qualifiers uh, and he played against Argentina and Brazil. But in terms of playing for Santos, his last appearance was in July 23rd when the team tied 2-2 at home against Botafogo. And yeah, this season, I think he's had a total of 32 minutes in the field. So it's not looking really good, great. But of course, let's not forget that these players need time. And if they're brought in too quickly in the starting 11 with those veterans that I mentioned earlier that came in, then he's not going to have any point of proving uh, other fans who he is. So let's give it a little bit more time and then let's see how he proceeds. Of course, he plays probably for the under 20 side of Santos and hopefully he can develop there. One of my favorite players, actually, Westy Patachi, the Brazilian, uh, he is very young as well, probably Miguelito's age. And I've been wanting him to play for the, the club since 2020. I think it was the first time that I saw him in the Copinha, which is a championship for teenagers uh, all around Brazil. And ever since then, I've always been that guy feeling like, okay, I need to see this guy playing in the regular basis for Santos. And normally he wouldn't play. And even if he played, he would come in as a substitute, sort of what's happening with Miguelito at the moment. But most recently, uh, his contract was re renewed for the first time. And he's offered, I believe, a two or three year contract with Santos. So starting from now, he can start and play with the team even more often. So I expect pretty much the same with Miguelito. Hopefully in the next year or two, he can make those starting uh, games for the for the club. And yeah, I would love to see him play more often because he looks like a great talent for the club and for the Bolivian national team as well. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, uh, Miguelito is one of those uh, guys that came from this uh, project called Bolivia 2022. Uh, Jordi Mola and Spanish uh, coach is the head of that project. They already brought a lot of young talent. What they what they did actually, they brought this methodology from Spain, from Europe, uh, and they put it into an, in, an space with infrastructure, with fitting, with the right exercising, uh, things that are not um, quite common to see in Bolivia, to be honest. So the results are visible, and Miguelito is one of the results of that. So immediately was seen by Santos, and they are having this kind of partnerships with the uh, with Brazilian team, and also some other players are going there. Bolivar also it's it, it's taking some players with the same uh, model, but with the uh, City Football Group, which is part of this Manchester City. Um, in the football network, which is also good, uh, always good to know. Bolivar is part for the ones that don't know. Uh, Bolivar is part of the city football group uh, network, and so they 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 get experience from the administration. Uh, also, the, the the new stadium and the new training campus was also built under these methodologies with this knowledge and this that experience exchange. So it's. It's great to, to, to have this uh, kind of, um, of um, opportunities, let's call it like that, because it's not like a company that you acquire. You need to do some kind of partnership stuff, and it's not easy to get into there because you need to offer something there, right? And that's thanks also to the chairman, Marcelo Claure, um yeah that's that's uh, one thing that i really wanted to remark here um for the ones on tiktok i have to disconnect the tiktok from the studio and put it here on my phone so feel free to ask a question in spanish if you want the ones that are joining we have a few people here so just any question you have any anything you like to talk about bolivar to talk about santos any question to my friend andrik uh, I don't know, Eric, are, are you single? Yes, I am. Oh, maybe we can find any any Latin girl for you. So, <laughs> Eric, we'll, we'll pass the Instagram in a moment. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs>
Right. Okay. So let's move forward and let's move to the topic that I really wanted to touch base here because we already talked the gambling the stuff. We already talked about Bolivar. Let me briefly talk about Bolivar because Bolivar just won on the return to the league because we were talking about a little of the league that was suspended. And now we are, um, Bolivar is back and it seems like this uh, post make uh, really good to the team. They won 5-0 um, to Always Ready. Always Ready is a team that uh, some that on the latest time was always um, on the lead, was uh, always on the first positions on the rankings of the league. So it's not an easy team at all. Um, despite the result, of course. So the first goal came on a free kick. Sorry, I, I cannot share um, the, the the video of, of of the highlights, but I will put it on on Bolivar news pages tonight if you want to to watch them. Of course, with the um, with the English version as well. So we will put it this tonight. But the first goal is a free kick uh, from Lionel Justiniano, the captain. Um, Bolivar did not score on a free kick the whole year, so it's it's really an achievement now. Um, then the second goal came uh, through the Ronnie Fernandez. So it was a uh, oh, with a with with the head uh, with a headshot, a uh, really good goal. And the the, the 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 pass was made by this U20 young player pass, which is also one of these. Uh, projects that comes in Bolivar that it's really, really um, making his part. Uh, then the third goal came from Diego Bejarano. The, the assistance was made by Ronnie Fernandez. And the last, uh, sorry, the fourth goal from Ramiro Vaca, one of the players that is way too requested by the supporters. It's normally on the bench. Um, we don't understand why, but of course, it's the coach decision. We respect that, but uh, seems like he's also asking for to have some lineup minutes there. And the last goal was uh, from the defense, Jairo Quinteros, and uh, on this kind of a place where the, the ball was going from one side to another in the, in, in, in the danger area, and the, he ended up just uh, putting the, the final touch. On, on that. So that's how Bolivar won yesterday. It was a great game. And um, yeah, now let's talk about the two projects. And this is one kind of a coincidence because Eric and myself know each other for a year, maybe. Eric, how long are we Twitter friends? I would say like six months. Six months? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, just, I just make it bigger. So yeah uh so in these six months uh, i guess we talk um, a lot on the spaces and on these twitch uh, shows and the big coincidence now is that both institutions that we support bolivar and santos are building their stadiums now they have the projects so let's talk about first about the great villa belmiro they have a nice project so can you tell us anything about it yeah villa belmiro is actually an old stadium uh it was built probably since it, the foundation of the club in 1912 and mm -hmm. it's called villa belmiro as we mentioned and right now it holds around 21,000 people at maximum but the attendance hasn't been, been that much recently i would say around 15 thousand people at most and yeah uh, i think it's a good idea of making these changes because you look at pretty much every club uh in syria A or in the brasilia row they have either a new stadium a new location or their current stadium got renovated during the 2014 world cup and one of the things that i like uh, of the new stadiums is because they look very cool but Another downgrade is when I became a Santos supporter, I was used to looking at the stadiums back how they used to be. And I wasn't really a fan of the new changes because it removed the feeling of this is what 
the Brasil Ra looked like, but of course, it's always good for the infra- infrastructure. The new stadiums, uh, the board is not sure when this is going to exactly start. I believe it would be around 2024, and it could take around 24 months. Uh, it's set to reach 30,000 seats, so 9,000 added to the current stadium. And it's going to probably cost around 71 million uh, euros to the club. Uh, Villa Belmiro, as we mentioned, is one of the oldest stadiums in Brazil. It was opened in 1916 when Santos beat Ipiranga 2-1. And, of course, it got very famous around the 1960s during Santos' golden age of Pele and other players uh, like Robert or the Carlos Alberto, I believe, the right back. And during the 1970s, um, the maximum number of supporters was actually recorded at the stadium with 31,660. So that was in a match against Palmeiras. And hopefully with the new infrastructure that's about to be built, uh, where the stadium is currently located, uh, hopefully that's going to open up more area and more opportunity for people to visit and uh, raise the revenues of the club overall. And what was the, the, the final capacity expected again? Uh, it's expected to be 30,000. So currently 21,000, so 30,000 max is what's expected. So they will double it, basically. They will be double. Well, the yeah, like I would say quarter more because currently 21,000, that's like oh, one third. 20. Oh, I understand. Yes. Okay, yeah, 20. Yeah, okay, so this is a big change. And mm-hmm. yeah, um, we're looking, I mean, the people that is on the Twitch, uh, we're looking on the images from, from the new stadium. It looks really uh, modern, really, really great uh, stadium. So hopefully it's going to, yeah, I mean, Brazil in terms of stadiums is it's another word. Mm-hmm. It's, it's crazy that all, all the stadiums or most of the stadiums are really, really in a great shape. So yeah. That's that's great to know, Andre. And how is it going to be financed? Do do we know that? Uh, I don't have that much information with me, but uh, I would say, looking at the club and the money that they've been getting from Europe in the last couple of years, with the they sold Neymar for around eighty million, and he sold Rodrigo to Real Madrid, and there's mm. so many big names, and it even raises you the question as a fan of. Where's this money going to? Because you don't see it invested in players, not even in the stadium. So now the change is coming with the stadium and that's probably what they're planning to do. And the, I, I believe Santos will have presidential elections at the end of this November. So maybe the current president is trying to like tell her, the supporters like, okay, this is our plan and hopefully he gets reelected by doing this with the current stadium. Yeah, um, I'm sure. I'm sure he will be. Um, yeah, it's kind of what Independiente of Argentina made it. Do you know how Independiente made the stadium? No, tell me about it. They they had a big project to build the new stadium of to to make some renewals and and things like that. Uh, but it was, I mean, it's very expensive. We're talking about not less than forty. 45 million of dollars, which is really big amount. So they sold Cunaguero. Oh, wow. The Manchester City. And that's how they afford it on the stadium. But, that's yeah. funny how you mentioned because I probably remember Aguero at Atletico Madrid, but I had no idea where he played in Argentina. So that's a very cool story that you just shared about Aguero playing in Independiente. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, yes, and that's that's one thing. Yeah, we we haven't seen him much on Independiente, but yeah, uh, that sold um, to the Atletico Madrid. You're right. That's what uh, that, that that's what made the uh, let's say the stadium possible. So yes, mm-hmm. that's what happened. That's how it happened. Also, um, yep. Okay, so nice story. So my turn now. So Bolivar people look at that. That's the dream. I mean, we all 
I'm still dream on it. Um, we have the Bladerani. Uh, it's a stadium that was built in the early 70s. Um, it was uh, built with this uh, wood stands, uh, which is no longer legal in professional competitions in South America. I guess also in Europe. So first and second divisions are not allowing anymore these wood stands. So for, for security reasons, of course. Uh, but yeah, the Bladerani, we saw the national squad. Uh, we saw um, Libertadores. We saw league games. And yeah, the stadium was finally um, somehow destroyed, let's say to rebuild the new one uh, the new one initially idea was to have it for i guess 35 38 thousand because bolivar is currently playing on the hernando Siles, which is an estate stadium it's property of the state right it's property of the government so that stadium has a capacity of 42 to 45,000 people. And, but the reality is that the, the Bolivian teams are not getting that quantity of supporters on regular games and on a regular basis, of course. So average attendance might be around 10,000, 12,000. It's really, really low one of the lowest of the region. So that's how, when the design was uh, discussed, they decided that this would be for 23,000 people. So that's the idea to have that, um, uh, the stadium. And I think it's on an initial stage, of course, if the, if the capacity is going up, of course, maybe they will do remodelations. I don't know, but yeah. For now, this is 23,000 and it will cost around 60 million um, dollars, which it's divided in three parts. One part it's covered by the um, centenario membership. So the supporters getting these centenarios uh, memberships models. So uh, I will talk about that in a moment. Um, another part will be on sponsorship plus player selling. So that that also it's part of the construction. And the last part will be covered by the chairman, Marcelo Claudio. So, and it's around calculated. The idea is to have 20 million covered per each uh, segment, but we will see. Um, of course, Marcelo mentioned also that he will cover whatever it's the remaining part that, that is not covered. But yeah, the idea is to have a modern, uh, a modern stadium with where we can have those kind of uh, of mezzanines on uh, where we can see the where you can have all these commodities and that stuff to see the the, the march from from the stands uh, and of course that those ones will be for, for sale and that will also cover part of the of the stadium building cost and of course they will have these uh, restaurants uh gym um, these uh, event rooms and stuff like that so that can also be um leverage on, on that sense so on, on the spaces and so so that's mainly the idea of, of Tembladerani, the stadium. So, yeah, not, not sure if you have any question there. Yeah, the stadium looks very cool. And you mentioned the price around 60 million, which is very close to what Santos is spending, maybe 10 million more. But OK, that's very close, I think. And is this I was curious to know, is this something that you see normally clubs in Bolivia or even in South America do often or only the clubs that have money like Bolivar or the strongest or teams like that? Yeah, unfortunately, and um, for the people that manage teams or the ones that are studying football management and st that stuff, the infrastructure is the last thing that you can cover. 
because it's the most expensive and unfortunately it's what brings you more benefits but you really need to have a big big um wallet let's say like that right or a big account uh, big big you, you need to, to to have big funding for that and it's not easy to get that so independiente and santos is a big example how you can make it and you need to be lucky for that um of course that there are efforts behind like you when you uh prepare a player when you train a player when you give those um uh, those benefits to your player of course you will you, you you're building a star uh, you know and an, an athlete and that's that, that's uh, how you justify it and then that's fine but not not always happen like that not always you're able to to to, to put a player on the market just like that it's very difficult so it's not common i saw a big revolution on the stadiums in ecuador was one uh, mm -hmm. emelec barcelona liga de quito and now independiente del valle as well those right. four teams have stadiums that have the, the level of an european stadium it's really crazy what they have on infrastructure and of course brazil but with Brazil, uh, the World Cup had a lot to do there. I mean, it was not. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to be unfair. Of course, they 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 could make it anyway because they have that that that, um, that founding, that level of founding. They made that quantity of money, but the World Cup helped them a lot on that sense. And also, Argentina can say, but the, the stadiums are really catching hold. I mean, the the only one that it's, let's say, the most, um, the nicest, let's see, and it's because they have remodelation works is River Plate, but right. they they really make uh, we we, uh, we with that player that was sold, I guess, to the Chelsea, they made one portion of that. What they want on the on the Libertadores Cups, and they are they always putting uh, players on the market. So they have really good finance help, let's say. Um, so River Plate can make it on that. Boca is also uh, seeking to. I mean, they they, are, they want to make a decision. They have to make a decision. They want to either. Uh, Complete. I don't want to say that because my my sound insulting for the uh, Boca Juniors people. It's not, uh, I swear. But they can either complete the stadium, like build the the, the 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 missing part of the stadium, or just move the whole thing away and build a new one. There's a nice project if you Google it. The new Bombonera, I guess is the name. Mm -hmm. um, you will see the new model of Boca Juniors is telling me it's crazy. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, I don't see them. I mean, um, Colombia has also good stadiums, good infrastructure, but it's also old, same as Argentina. Uh, Peru have this stadium, which is like a, kind of a model of a stadium, which is the Universitario, the Nacional. And but there from then there's not much there. Paraguay had the Cerro Porteño, La Nueva Olla, who is uh, which is um, you know a great stadium. It's modern. It's it's recently built. It's a nice one. Um, Uruguay has the Nacional also. That is the new new stadium. And what and Chile? Oh, it's Chile. Uh, Chile. They made remodelation on there. Nacional de Santiago, but right. it's a state stadium, but nothing more. I mean, it's not common to bring that kind of infrastructure to this continent, to be honest with you. Yeah, you're right. And you mentioned La Bombonera. I heard a couple of things about them and potentially moving to a new place, which is going to be even easier because they wouldn't have to deal with what's around them. But the fans really wanted to be where the stadium is currently located because they have all the memories, the trophies that they won. And of course, I understand them because I feel the same way with Santos. I said this earlier, 
uh, when the 2014 stadiums were rebuilt, many teams well, like Flamengo, Fluminense had the Maracanã completely changed and Atletico Mineiro, Grêmio, every stadium around Brazil. And then you would see Santos with nothing new. And in a way, you would ask yourself, well, I wish the stadium looked a, a bit different. But then you remember the good times when you started supporting the team and you wish, honestly, that everything would remain as it currently is. But of course, uh, with time, things have to change. And uh, again, the Boca Junior Stadium, I saw some crazy clips on TikTok last year or two in which all the fans were jumping all together and then you would see the cement sort of moving and hoping that in a way that doesn't cause any catastrophe because imagine all those people potentially dying. It's going to be a very tragic story and nobody wants to see that, not only in South America, but anywhere in the world. So... Hopefully they get that sorted out. And if they have no other option, then yeah, they can probably move somewhere else. But it's going to be a good idea to stay where they currently are. Yeah, and this this is kind of nostalgic thing here. I mean, of course, uh, many teams uh, have this neighborhood uh, romanticism, right? Like they want to stay where they were born, where they were um, grown, let's say. But what happened in the cities is that cities are getting bigger, are getting modern, so they need to move somehow. And I don't see it with bad eyes. And actually for Boca Juniors would be kind of a fresh start. So, and, and they may have even better planification for the future to, to also to handle that people because what is happening I live close to the River Plate Stadium for example and I always just struggle with um, uh, with the traffic when there is a River Plate game and I really struggle with that so yeah I guess uh, it's uh, it's time to for Boca to to just I think out of the box and just move the stadium and yeah I I would do that but you know we never right. know we never know okay saying that Enrique let me just jump to this um the, this is the Ananta training campus this is part of the Bolivar Centenario plan uh where that's the plan where the um, supporters are getting memberships there are three categories we have light blue we have golden and we have platinum you can become uh or you can get your your centenario membership wherever you are in the world uh for and it's it's not expensive um for a light blue one uh, you it's uh, 50 dollars per year which is good for the golden one, you have the $200 per year and you get a t-shirt, a classic t-shirt. Oh, I don't have mine now. Um, but yeah, you, you, you get t-shirts that are um, jerseys that are um, exclusive, edition limited ones. So you have those ones that are exclusive for uh, Centenario membership tenants. Platinum, the same plus you have um exclusive access for the events so if you live in bolivia and you're platinum you really can enjoy those benefits uh, but uh, with the golden membership even if you're abroad you can also enjoy discounts you can enjoy them with this uh this exclusive uh jersey so i will bring one in a moment maybe you can i can disappear from a for, from a moment and yeah if you get the the golden membership you will get a small plate, it's not small, it's like this size plate on the new stadium wall with your name. And for the platinum memberships, you will you will have a star with your name on the um, a tunnel that drives the players from the, from the dressing room to the pitch. So yeah, it's really worth to to get the centenario membership. So for the ones that are abroad, just um, just do not hesitate to do that. And let's talk about now, 
qualifiers, my friend. Let's talk about national squads. So give me a moment. You can maybe start and do the tandem for me while I'm looking for the jerseys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's funny how this is our third or fourth episode together. And ever since then, uh, Brazil actually played the first game against your team, Bolivia. And it was, of course, hosted in Brazil, I believe, in the Northeastern Stadium, which is, I believe, Clube de Remo, currently Serie D side. But anyways, this was a very great game, of course, if you're a Brazilian and a Brazilian supporter like me. So... Uh, Brazil actually started by scoring first with Rodrigo. Uh, Rafinha scored, Rodrigo scored another, and then Neymar also had two goals in which he broke uh, the record for most goals scored for the national team, overpassing Pelé, who had 77, and Neymar now has 79. So uh, it was a really fantastic moment for people to be watching that game and or even people like me who have followed Neymar since 2011. And honestly, this is a stat that I've been looking at since I was 10, 11 years old, always wanting to see Neymar be high up in that table. And finally, he had the chance to do that against Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia, uh, as bad as they played, at least they got a, a goal around the 78 minute. And Abrego just broke Ederson's net and stopped him from getting the clean sheet in this match which was a very good game honestly brazil had a crazy uh, or amazing performance but then the other game which was played away from brazil at peru many brazilians were expecting at least two or three goals scored and it didn't come and finally at least one of them came in the 90th minute uh, after a corner kick by uh, Neymar assisted to Marquinhos. He had it. He heads it in, and finds the opener for Brazil and the very important three points. And looking at the first performance, I said that maybe Brazil could even become first in that table that you're showing right now on the screen. But after the second game against Peru, things did not look good at all. I don't know what went wrong. Maybe the high altitude, as me and Peter usually mention, of teams playing or even clubs in South America and Peru is always going to be a difficult place to play in and of course it's going to be even more difficult when we play Bolivia away from home so overall uh, we got the six points needed but the team definitely needs to improve I believe in the next week or two we're going to be versing uh, Venezuela at home but then we have to go to Uruguay and verse them so that's going to be a difficult task they have some very very good players and comparing them with the 2014 or 2018 world cup maybe they no longer have Luis Suarez or Cavani because of course the age plays an effect there but look at their players uh, they have Sergio Rochette currently at Internacional he's playing amazingly well with the club uh, and then they also have defenders like Araujo from Barcelona and midfielders uh forget his name he scored a banger yesterday against Napoli um, Valverde so he's another amazing player of course plays for the Uruguayan national team the striker Darwin Nunez so of course things have changed and Brazil needs to evolve and learn how their style of play if we want to come out succeeding in that match as well yeah I mean uh, going to that to this Brazil uh, uh, match against Brazil we really felt the way, I mean, the two for initial, uh, let's say, um, games were against the two biggest teams. I don't think that's a coincidence. But, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to, 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 to play against Brazil. Brazil is a team like it's way, way, how to say, it's way too skillful. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. really a team that it has no mercy on anything, right. and it's it's crazy how how things went. And also, there was there were a good performance from Biscara, the, the, the goalkeeper. Uh, he you know uh, he he just got a, a penalty uh, from Neymar, which is not minor, but. I mean, still, it's you. You felt really the pain. You have the players coming on your on your field 
all the time they have this uh, intensity on the on the game that, that they never stop so this is it's really difficult and you really feel the difference uh, on, on the uh, against the, those kind of rivals and in regards of the match against Argentina I mean this team of Argentina and I that just uh, closed my idea that this is one of the best national squads I've ever seen of, of, of uh, Argentina and they demonstrate that playing in the altitude like they never did before they were playing just like they were in Buenos Aires so yeah, and they did it without Messi so that's even a crazier fact because nobody would think that Argentina would come in with substitute team if I could say and with McAllister names that we didn't even see before the World Cup and perform like that crazy how they did it in Bolivia yeah I mean but I mean Messi of course is one of the best players of the world and stuff like that but still this national this national squad had a lot a lot uh, or, 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 or tons of players that are uh, stars on, on their teams it, it's always been like that with Argentina mm -hmm. but the way how they are playing how they are assembling it's crazy I mean they play like they were playing I don't know since they were six right I mean it's it's like they know each other uh, from the whole life and they are having fun I mean they they, they did not get stressed uh, just like uh, other generations and I and I and I'm saying this respectfully uh, of course I live in Argentina and I, 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 I have close relationship with Argentinians and but the, 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 the environment that you can feel you can perceive on this squad is something I not seen much often in even in normal squads in clubs i just saw this in the national squad once maybe but yeah this partnership that uh, that sense of having fun is something that i really I, I i really enjoy and i really think that argentina it's still a way too strong candidate to win the cup again completely agree with that because yeah of course they have been good in uh world cup where maybe they didn't have the chance to play uh against south american teams or maybe not at all but yeah pretty much they look very scary they won copa america two years ago so if brazil is not there to win it uh argentina is always going to be there and they'll take that opportunity whether with or without messi so it won't change much in my opinion yeah, I'm agree with that. Yeah. They have Julian Alvarez, who I believe scored just today uh, in a big match against Leipzig. So he's a very young talent, around 21, 22 years old, if not even younger. So it's crazy of how he came from uh, South America and is performing like that with City and even with Argentina. So he's doing very, very well. And they have a good gem in their hands at the moment yeah that's that that's right um yeah let's see because argentina has a lot a lot to to show still um yeah okay Enric, before we pass to the next topic that's what i promise i just wanted to show before i forget this exclusive jerseys that we have in bolivar look at this this is very cool this is like uh, the, the old model where the club was founded with the old uh, shield i don't know if it's visible club cb club bolivar mm -hmm. used to be like that so this is from puma so this is also exclusive from the centenary membership tenant also for the people from tiktok to asking me that uh yeah look at this but yeah maybe people from tiktok are more familiar with this than the twitch ones and this is the, the this year's one so it's another classic um yeah that the, the the material of this one is it's really nice um, yeah 
I, I the other day I went on training on this one and it's really great and it's with the recycled materials or this new concept of uh, uh, the eco-friendly stuff there so yeah so yeah yeah so saying that let's jump to our next topic there uh, oh sorry which is the big one i'm still crying about this <laughs> but yeah we have libertadores so what can you say let's talk about first let's talk about brazil inside inter fluminense how did you feel the game i mean the things i'm in my opinion were completely changed by the decisions of the referee and if uh fluminense did not get that red card which happened around the 30th or 40th minute mark fluminense could have won two three nil in my opinion but they got sent off and they have to change their style of play, which we normally see in South America. Even if they were winning, I believe teams in, in the Southern continent, they always tend to defend a lot and they don't want to concede. And now that they someone got sent off, it got even bigger. And Fluminense was very scared into going forward. And when you're scared, the other, the other team is going to take that opportunity. They're not going to defend. Everybody's going to attack and, whether they scored one or two goals offside, at least they got the 2-1 advantage Internacional. And crazy because I really thought that Fluminense would have an easy job into passing Inter. Uh, I mean, still, they did amazingly well, but tying 2-2 at Maraca now with Herman Cano. And don't even get me started how good this guy is. Maybe not this season when it comes to the Brazilian league, but in the Copa Libertadores, he's been scoring goals left, right and center. He was one of the top scorers last year for the Brasile Rao. And of course, uh, as long as Fluminense has them, has him as a in the starting eleven, he's always going to use any opportunity and score. He reminds me of Zlatan Ibrahimovic in Europe. So he he's he's aged as well. And I think he always goes for those crazy kicks and shots. In he seems to score many of them. But in terms of the game, it's funny how in an hour and a half from now we're going to see the second leg played in uh, Bay Rio in International Stadium. And I still feel that Fluminense can go forward. I still believe that they can grab a winner here away from home and qualify for the final. And if they do that, then they're going to have to first either Palmeiras or Boca Juniors, which was another crazy game that happened last week, 0-0 at uh, La Bombonera. And I expect Palmeiras to completely smash Boca Juniors tomorrow. So, in my opinion, we're going to see a Palmeiras Fluminense final. Hopefully, not only as a Santos supporter because Palmeiras are my rivals, but I would love to see Fluminense lift their first ever Copa Libertadores title. They have never won this competition before, and many teams in Brazil seem to make fun of them because of this reason. So, in my opinion, Probably. they're a great team. They won Libertad or they won the Serie A many years uh, in the past decade. So. I hope to see them lifted for the first time ever this year. And it seems like the perfect time to do it. There's no Flamengo, there's no Corinthians. So their only rivalry could be Internacional and maybe Palmeiras in the final. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, what happened is something similar to you. I thought um, Fluminense was stronger than it was on this, on this first leg. Um, I felt that they were too much permissive. They let too much to play to to Inter. I mm. guess um, I think on the group stage, Fluminense was more um, had had less mercy, <laughs> let's say, on rivals. So right. and I I I felt like it was too distant. He they just um, let them play. And you cannot, and I know from low knowledge, um, you cannot let Inter play, never. Because they have kind of players of Patrick, Alan Patrick and Valencia, that they yeah. really take the opportunities. 
they don't they they are not wasters <laughs> they did not waste opportunities they really really just put it on the target so i that's what i felt and it was really disappointing from the first half when when they were i guess two goals below i i said this is this is over <laughs> this is over there's no way they can revert this they somehow revert it hopefully they will remember how to play on the second leg uh, or not how to play because i this not it's, i'm not attacking them i'm just saying that they can show more than what they show on the on the first part of this libertadores at least on the group stage that that on the on on the uh, on that side of the uh, of the um, of the semi-final but yeah again I, I i still believe that fluminense can make it i mean will be finalist um but based on what i saw so far up to here yeah and it's not I... hate because uh, it's not hate against inter because uh, <laughs> they they just did disqualified believer no the, the, that that's something besides the topic I am telling this because I I follow them both, and I so much more uh, from Fluminense than from Inter. Inter went from less to more on this last part of the competition, but they did not have the best of the starts. So that's from one side, and yeah, go. On. I mean, I agree with you absolutely because you compare the two teams since the beginning of the year when they played the state leagues. Internacional didn't even make it to the final. They lost uh, to Caxias del Sol, which is a four division side in penalties. And they're not looking good in the table as well. Currently, like, I think they're like three points away from the relegation zone. They sacked or their former manager uh, has moved on. So things have changed. And yeah, you look at Fluminense, they actually won the Carioca against Flamengo in the final. In the Brasilia Rao, I thought that they would they would be doing much better, but currently around the fifth or sixth spot, it's not too bad with 13 weeks left. But in terms of the match that you mentioned earlier, uh, Fluminense had crazy performances. They performed well in the group stage where they beat 5-1 River Plate, which was an amazing result, but... Then you look at Internacional, not only they have Ener Valencia that performed really well in the World Cup, but they brought in some other new names. Uh, and I was surprised to see Hugo Malo, a Spaniard. He played for Celta Vigo, and I remember him two or three seasons ago in La Liga. And this was the first time ever that I see him. And I didn't even know that he moved to Internacional and he scored a goal. Uh, Aranguiz, another player that played in Bundesliga for a long time, I believe, Bayer Leverkusen. Alan Patrick, he played for Santos. He won the Copa Libertadores actually in 2011. So he knows exactly well what needs to be done in order to lift this trophy, whether if it's with Santos or with Inter. But yeah, I expect this is going to be a tough match. If any team wins, it's either going to be a 0-0 and someone wins in penalties or it is a 1-0 defeat by either side. But uh, I believe Inter can go through, but I hope Fluminense does that and pulls out the impossible. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, yeah, and on the on the how can how to say on the other side, another big disappointment on Palmeiras, which is my candidate from the day one. Um, yeah, and I always said that, and I'm not shy to say that Palmeiras is really. It's kind of magic they do like that. Mm. It's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of that, right? And it's uh, what Palmeiras do with the rivals is crazy. And what I saw against Boca was completely different thing. I see nothing, basically. I, it was really disappointing for me. Right. So I, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. But um, they need to revert that. I mean, they, they, they are a strong candidate. This is their opportunity to win this cup. I think um, having this turf surface on, on their stadium 
can really make the difference. Bolivar struggled that a lot, um, but this is a natural advantage, and I'm not blaming the result on that. I mean, Bolivar has also altitude, and this is natural advantage, and you have to play. To win the cup, you have to play wherever you have to play, and you have to win all the games. And that's what happened in the cup. So yeah. I think I think that, the, or, or I hope, the match would be um, different. And I, I think Palmeiras will show a different face on this guy, on this upcoming one. So hopefully that, that would be there. They have to because they played in they played Boca tied zero zero and they played very defensively. It seemed like they were only focused on that return leg and the fact that it's going to be played in Brazil. It's going to play a huge role and even on Sunday uh, they played against uh, state rivals Rebel Bragantino, which is a team that has been coming in from Serie B in the recent years. And this year they're currently in the second place. They beat Palmeiras two one at home. And Palmeiras didn't even use their starting 11, so they were preparing for that return leg, which will be played tomorrow. And the only player that I think I saw was Richard Rios and Enrique. Enrique ended up scoring, but of course, he's very young and he's not going to have trouble flying back and forth to return back to Sao Paulo. So, yeah, I expect this to be a, a great match. And if anything... I'm going with a crazy prediction here. I'm going to say Palmeiras 3-0, and they're going to do something that they did against Deportivo Pereira, although not in Brazil, but they did it in the first leg. So as long as they know that they did not concede one in Argentina, they're going to always go forward and push for goals in this match. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's going to be true no. I mean... <sighs> Well, well, one thing. Boca lost the derby on this week, last weekend. Mm-hmm. Lost two 0 on their own on their home stadium. So, from a motivational perspective, I don't know how much does uh, does the impact would be on that sense. So it's difficult to calculate, but if Palmeiras plays the way it's been, they've been playing this cup, and Boca plays the way they've been playing on this cup, that result is not that crazy as it may sound. Right. It can be kind of a more logic result, but what I saw from, especially Fluminense and Palmeiras on this first leg shows also that this cup has, it's really dynamic, really changed on the performance level. I don't know if it's even motivational. You're almost there and you can somehow feel this drop down. Um, But I don't know, it's difficult for me to say, but I think Palmeiras will win. And just like every single Brazilian team, when then when the first comes and the second comes, then you put your seatbelt on. Otherwise, uh, you would be with a, I don't know six goals again <laughs> because Brazilians are like that. Uh, no mercy. So, yeah. but yeah, let's see. That's going to be a really nice match to watch. Um, 100%. W- what about Fluminense? What's y- what's your your prediction there? I'm going 0-0. And if someone scores, hopefully it's Fluminense. But maybe we could see penalty kicks. But yeah, this is going to be a tough match. And Fluminense won't be able to use Samuel Xavier because he got sent off in the last match. And he was the man that actually qualified them back in the games against Argentina's juniors. Do you remember those crazy goals that he scored? They were losing 1-0, and then I believe in the 96, he tied 1-1, crazy shot outside the box. And then they played the second leg in Brazil, in which they were tied 0-0 for a long time. And Samuel Xavier was the first to break in and score, I believe, around the 85th minute until they found the second in the extra time. But yeah, he was a 
very important part of Fluminense's team. So without having him, I'm not sure what Fernando Geniz is going to have planned for tonight, but hopefully it's going to look good for them. And yeah, I'm not expecting many goals. All the goals that I expect are going to come tomorrow in Palmeiras' Boca match. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch the. I mean, let's see. Let's see. But yeah, Libertadores is something that really, that I really love to, to see. And this one, this particular one was special for me because we returned it from the group stage because the, the previous editions we've been, we've been playing this uh, pre-qualifying stage where we, we never qualified, um, at least in the last, I guess, six years or more, maybe. And this one, we were one candidate. I, I'm not saying that we were about to win, but we were a strong candidate there. And yeah, but unfortunately, we we just uh, stumbled against Valencia, and here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Hendrik, my friend, I guess we cover almost everything. We're almost over time. Any final words, anything to add, maybe? Because it's been, it's been a while, of course, since we haven't, uh, didn't have this kind of sessions. And now we're back and I hope we can make it more regularly um more on a regular basis but anything you like to cover with santos um uh, well i don't think i have anything else to add other than the fact that the situation with the team is still not looking good hopefully in the next couple of matches actually we're going to be playing palmeiras as soon as they're done in their game against boca jr so they play tomorrow and then on sunday will be the palmeiras santos derby uh in the first round of matches, we tied 0-0 at our home in our home stadium, but the game was very difficult. And comparing the two teams, Santos was much better back then compared to how they are now. But hopefully we get a draw again. Uh, the last time we played in their stadium, I believe we lost 4-0 or 4-1. So it's very difficult to play there. And if they don't win against Boca Juniors tomorrow, they're going to use all the anger and they, they're going to express it to Santos. Maybe we see five, six goals scored by Palmeiras. So that's another reason why I'm hoping for Palmeiras to win tomorrow so that they're a little bit more relaxed on the weekend. Yeah, yeah let me let me say hi here. Some greetings from my friend Kikai here, Pablo Flores, a journalist from Bolivia as well here on the TikTok. So hi guys, thank you for joining. And yeah, that's that's good to to have you here. Okay, Hendrik, I guess we uh got to the final of our session today. It's always it's a pleasure having you here. And yeah um talk to you uh for oh sorry important thing follow smoking snake on twitter you don't have instagram of the smoking snake don't you no we, we normally just use the twitter account and that's where people reach us out or learn more about uh, brazilian football but thank you so much sepe this has been amazing of course it's the fourth time that i come into the show but i'm more than happy to participate again and again so it's always nice to talk to you and learn more about bolivian football south america so it was a really nice episode yeah no the owner was all mine my friend so it's always great to talk to you about football learn about brazilian football and have this exchange so maybe we can do a special edition after this uh, semi-final of libertadores so uh, where we can talk about libertadores itself uh, let's see and yeah, and let's see how we can cover that. So, but yeah, um, for the ones that have been with us, um, follow us, Bolivar News, all the platforms. And I will stay a little longer on the on the TikTok, but here from the Twitch, uh, we can we can disconnect. So, thank you so much, Andre. Thank you so much to the ones that uh, were connected. 
um yeah um you will see you will be able to watch this recording in our twitch channel and in youtube as well so people thank you so much long live to the football and have a great rest of the week thank you Okay, Enric, we're out. Are Thank we you still so much. Live? Sorry? Are we still live? Because I see on the top left it says live, but maybe it's just me and you or something like that. Let me check Twitch. Yeah, we're still live on Twitch.